the wacky world of Multimedia J. A while back, video game satire site Dorkly did an article about all kinds of stuff that's wrong with the console industry. It was called, If New Game Console Reveals Were Honest. And though I found the whole comic to be rather funny, there was one part of it that really stuck out. The part about controllers. Hey, you know that old controller that was perfectly fine? We've got a new controller with the same design, but with some minor changes to justify making you buy brand new ones. Additional button! <laughs> and as much as I found this article to be rather funny, this controller bit has just stuck with me ever since. Ladies and gentlemen, here is my sad little attempt to get every controller that I've ever purchased for any system that I've had to all fit on my desk at once. Yeah, that's a lot of controllers, and that's a lot of money spent that potentially didn't need to be spent on controllers. I honestly think James Rolfe should do a BS segment, or you know what's BS segment, on game controllers. Because the further you get in terms of what I bought when, the more ridiculous it gets in terms of which control, in terms of why I bought the controllers that I bought. Some of these, of course, are packing controllers, but really. <sighs> that Dorkly article was spot on about how annoying controllers get in terms of costing money and making us spend money that perhaps we don't really need to spend. Now, if I still had my original first console, the ill-fated Atari 7800, we'd be beginning this discussion with, a, with the 7800's horrendous knuckle-hurting joystick. Unfortunately, I think the uh, version of the 7800 that had an actual gamepad was Europe only. So we're going to start with the NES instead, which is a perfectly fine system to start with, because the controller is absolutely iconic these days. Didn't have a lot of buttons, wasn't exactly what I call ergonomic with its square shape, but it worked, and this one still works. I don't, uh, unfortunately, I don't still have my original NES from when I was a kid. However, I do have this controller, which I picked up as part of a failed experiment with a multi-tap for the Wii that was supposed to let you play virtual console games with the original controllers. It, missed, it messed up some of the button mapping on some of the controllers, so I wound up scrapping the idea. And now, these retro controllers are just waiting for me to pick up a Famiclone that takes the original controllers, like the Super Retro Trio or the, or the Retron 5. Don't know when that's going to happen, but whenever I do, I have plenty of original controllers in very good shape to use with the system. This is a perfectly fine controller, by the way. It's just not very ergonomic, and it doesn't have a lot of buttons. So, Nintendo, of course, outdid themselves a couple of years later with... The Super Nintendo Controller. Such a classic piece of hardware. This one still works perfectly fine. The most I've ever needed to do with these controllers is rub some alcohol on the contacts when the buttons start getting a little bit of blue type stuff in them. This controller still works perfectly fine. The cross key's still A-OK. -okay. I call these cross keys instead of D-pads because, well, this is a cross key. It's shaped like a you know, cross type symbol, whereas a more modern D-pad is more something like this. So we'll get to that stuff eventually though. Super Nintendo, such a classic controller. It added shoulder buttons, it add up, down, left, right, select start four buttons here, which would form the which would form the basically the standard for so many controllers afterwards. So many controllers these days now stick with four buttons, even though some people experimented with six. This, of course, inspired the PlayStation controller, which inspired the DualShock, which inspired that lovely standard we have today of two analog sticks, a bunch of buttons, and an up, down, left, right, and some maybe some other buttons as well. Perfectly fine controller. Yet even during my days with the NES and the SNES, I spent money I didn't need to really need to on controllers because of... Turbo! With the NES, it was the NES Advantage. With the Super Nintendo, it was this high-frequency thing, which still had somewhat okay build quality, but unfortunately, they didn't really do a good job of tying, of doing up a knot inside this thing to keep you from pulling the cord through the rubber shielding. I could resolder this and fix this and get rid of the drafting tape I used back in the day to try and, <laughs> to try and keep it together. <laughs> yeah, drafting tape is not a good thing to use on wires, folks, but it's what I had back then. So <laughs> I had some drafting classes in high school, and uh, we didn't have a lot of electrical tape around the house. So perfectly fine controller, though, even though it's third party. These buttons are plasticky, and after all these years, the start button 
is sticking. We've got little switches for turbo. And of course, I had Enver's LNR here too, so I could use them alongside the ADXY. Perfectly fine controller, and I'll bet it still works, except for the sticky start button that needs a little uh, alcohol or something like that. Something to clean it up. So yeah, not as good on the quality. And of course, I didn't know at the time that I that game development was really getting away from the kinds of spam the fire button games like Contra and stuff. Well, even with Contra, once you got the next gun up from the starting gun, you had rapid fire and you didn't need a turbo controller. So turbo controllers kind of fell by the wayside and this is basically the last turbo controller or the latest turbo controller that I ever had. Not counting, of course, this six button Sega controller that I picked up as part of my failed experiment with the uh, multi tap on the Wii. Still have it. Whenever I get a console, a Famiclone that takes original controllers, I will use this. And I will also use this if I ever want to play an Atari again, because of course Genesis and Atari have the same kind of port for whatever reason. And yes, I did use an Atari joystick to play Sonic once over a friend's house who had a Genesis. So, okay, but this is kind of anachronistic because I didn't have a Genesis back in the day. So technically, the Super Nintendo Turbo Controller was really um, the last one of those types that I had. So, here's the thing. As we move forward, we're going to start getting into more and more ridiculous reasons to upgrade controllers. Especially when we get into the later generation consoles and the PC side of things. Yeah, that Dorkly article had some darn good points about how things have gotten these days. Moving right along... Nintendo 64! Yeah, don't I wish I could impersonate that screaming kid like that at my age. Yeah, Nintendo 64. Weird design, but it brought the analog stick. The often, the often loved analog stick into play. So it was an upgrade over the previous, up, down, left, right only. Etc. Weird design though, although there were some games where you could do this with the stick. You could do this with the stick. Cruising USA could be played with one hand. Just hold down the trigger to accelerate and then just steer like this. Fortunately, this controller is in pretty good shape because I recently dismantled the controller, uh, the, the, uh, the analog stick, and got rid of the controller dust. So this thing's in really good shape for an old N64 controller. This is the one that came with my system back in 1996. Of course, I wound up having to buy another controller to play two-player, so I actually have a black version of this, too. And that was the one that I used the more often, and so this one kind of hasn't been used as much. But still, to play two... But still, when you consider that previously, my NES came with two controllers, and my Super Nintendo came with two controllers, the N64 didn't. So we wound up shelling out money just to play two-player. And of course, I never played four-player, but the classic at-home, you know, having fun playing two-player games thing. First system I had to shell out money in order to buy a controller just to have something that basic. PlayStation 2! That classic console and the best-selling console of all time, from what I've heard. PlayStation 2, oh, I don't know. I think, yeah, did it break the Atari's record? I don't know. Anyways, uh, so this is, uh, so PlayStation 2, this is the, I got mine used. And this is the ratty controller that came with it, and it's gotten rattier as it has set in the, and as it has sat in the drawer for the past several years. This thing is sticky and disgusting, and there's crap everywhere. So yeah, my first PS2 was a used system. So ultimately, so it came with this horrendous controller. I wound up replacing it with two brand new DualShock 2s, which have been perfectly fine controllers ever since. And this, well. <laughs> I don't know why I even still have this thing. It desperately needs a cleaning. It needs alcohol everywhere. Probably should dismantle it too, because some of these buttons have gotten sticky over the years. Maybe it's something with the plastic or something, but you can just see all the crap that's in all of... Yeah, look, ugh, look at that gross stuff. But I don't use this controller. Either way, though, I wound up buying two of these, and these this is a perfectly fine controller. However, could you use these with the PlayStation 3, even though these were perfectly usable controllers? Not that I know of. Whoop-dee-doo! It's wireless! The two buttons here have been swapped with analog triggers, which is a nice touch. This is pretty much a standard feature nowadays. So, okay, they changed two of the buttons and added a thing to turn on the PS3 with, or a PlayStation button. Yay! I think this is probably the kind of controller that that Dorkly article is making fun of. Whoop-dee-doo! It's wireless! What was wrong with this? Absolutely nothing. Except maybe less control with these triggers, because they're not analog. 
So wow, two buttons change and they add a button to make the wireless work. Oh yeah, and six axis for all those games that had six axis. Oh wait, that's right. Sony came out with a motion controller similar to the Wii mode afterwards. So other than that game where you did this and the dragon flew around on the screen, <laughs> that was so long ago that I, that the name escapes me right now. Yeah, six axis. Is... <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, nice improvement to make this controller, this perfectly fine controller, obsolete just because it has a wire and less bells and whistles. Pfft. But before everyone thinks that I'm just going to start bashing Sony, oh no, Nintendo's done this kind of stuff too. You'll notice we kind of broke away from the Nintendo consoles for a bit. Well, here's a little intermission with a Retro Duo controller, an absolutely horrendous knockoff of the Super Nintendo controller. Cheap, very light bet there's hardly anything inside of it. This is painted on plastic. You can actually scratch the paint off. These buttons never worked all that well. And basically playing Super Nintendo games with this controller is like a special kind of hard mode. Looks nice, feels awful. I understand later Retro Duo controllers improved notably, but of course the real showstopper here was this solid shiny plastic cross key, which is very stiff and you could press the whole thing down at once. Yeah, what a mess. But even when we weren't talking about third party knockoffs, yeehaw! Redneck on a motorcycle outside. Nintendo. <laughs> Let's just move on here. GameCube. Yeah, who remembers those commercials? The GameCube controller was an absolute classic. Easily one of Nintendo's best controllers, if not their best controller ever. This thing was ahead of its time in so many ways. First, one analog stick up here and the other down here, kind of similar to what the Xbox 360 eventually wound up doing. These were analog. You could depress them a little or click them all the way. So kind of similar to what we've got today set of buttons along here and some other things as well and a start button except it was wired but this oh yeah let's not forget the z button up top too this thing was such a classic that despite having a classic controller and the wii u pro controller having come out since then nintendo apparently is making something to allow gamecube controllers to be used with smash brother to the next smash brothers game for the wii u that really says it all when this game is getting when this controller is getting a retro redo because of because it's such that it's that good of a controller unfortunately after the gamecube nintendo decided to try and be clever for being clever's sake do, 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 do. we would like to play and play they did as nintendo played every card in their hand to make the wii amount to something despite its vast inferiority when it came to hardware and the wii remote was quite an interesting experiment so if you bought a wii you would get one of these bought a wii back in those days you would get one of these and hopefully the strap wouldn't have the uh, string on the strap wouldn't be too thin. This is after the first uh, recall slash replacement when this, or the replacement strings when the string straps, which were originally the size of fishing line, got thickened up after people started smashing their TVs. Ultimately, though, the Wii Remote, the simple Wii Remote, with its uh, television remote style thing and its motion controls, eventually morphed into this monster, the Wii Motion Plus with the big rubber grip thingy on it. Of course, I only I keep this one outside of any rubber grip thingies because this thing is used to just cycle to GameCube games on the Wii, so it's not really that important. This monster, on the other hand, of course, nowadays we get a Wii Mote. It'll come with Wii Motion Plus built in. However, the Wii basically introduced the idea of controller upgrades because if you wanted to play any, if you want to play half the decent games on the Wii, you had to always get a nunchuck to go with it. Yay! Yay! Two parts just to buy a new controller, which basically jacked up the price of additional controllers. I was used to buying controllers for about thirty dollars a pop. This brought them up to around fifty-ish. Yay, Nintendo! 
So, and what did we get for this? Well, we got something that couldn't function on its own. Oh, oh, by the way, also, if this did allow for an interesting mechanic what, that I call the divided controller, where you could spread your arms out and basically have your controller split up so you don't have to keep your hands clasped together while you're playing your games, but you could just relax in your easy chair or something with half the controller on each side and never the two hands shall meet. Great design, which unfortunately wasn't continued with the Wii U, although you can technically play games with these types of controllers on the Wii U, but the game has to support it. Oh, but the fun doesn't end here. Never mind the fact that the controller eventually had rubber things to put them in, which made it a little bit tough to change the batteries, because you had to take off the rubber thing, and then eventually an add-on through the Wii Motion Plus, and a bazillion other controller thingies that the Wii Mote could fit inside, like gun controllers and other stuff as well. But then we had two, count them, two generations of classic controllers oh yeah you want to play those virtual console games here's the one here's the first one that came out little round thing like a super nintendo controller with thumbsticks feels better playing super nintendo games not so much playing games that came out after the snes and then of course this one which of course is the dual shock wannabe version with the sets of buttons on the back so all this combined together per controller if you wanted to play multiplayer back in those days yeah, controller add-ons galore. Now you'd think that Nintendo would have learned their lesson from the Wii about not nickeling and diming their customers with controllers, controller upgrades, and controller accessories, but you would be wrong. Dun 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 the Wii U gamepad. This monstrosity, besides being a little clunky to hold, although it is extremely ergonomic, I'll give him credit for at least that, this monstrosity constitutes anywhere from one-third to half the cost of a Wii U. Which makes me wonder, how much better could the Wii U have sold if this thing wasn't mandatory? And if something should happen to your Wii U gamepad, as often happens to game controllers when they get accidentally dropped or something, or something happens to the touchscreen or something like that, you'll easily be looking at a triple-digit repair. Yowzus! Therefore, one would not want this monstrosity to be used any more than necessary, so you may be tempted to play certain games with the Wii Mote, or get one of these, a Wii U Pro Controller, which is sold separately and effectively adds $50 to the cost of a Wii U. For what? For a controller that is way more standardized and doesn't have a touchscreen in the middle to break, wear out, etc. So you can leave your touchscreen off to the side and use it as just like a little screen on the side instead of constantly holding it and potentially dropping it or something like that. Nice controller though. Two sticks, a bunch of buttons, some more buttons, and two and sets of triggers, very similar to the Xbox 360 controller, but this is something you have to get after the fact, and not all games support it. Yay! Controller nonsense on Nintendo boxes. Which of us NES kids that grew up would have ever dreamed we'd see this day? But Nintendo, sadly, isn't the worst offender when it comes to having to buy new controllers for utterly stupid reasons. That honor goes to the PC. Here is my very first PC controller. And it is very, very beat up and showing its age. But it's got everything you could ask for. Analog stick for analog control. A D-pad that clicks for digital control. Never like the clicky D-pad. Turbo functions. Automatic functions. A throttle. Two things you can... Two fingertip triggers underneath. Digital, though. you got to press them in and stuff. Six buttons. The works. This thing did all sorts of stuff. Perfectly fine controller. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it except the lack of a second analog stick. So why exactly, well, and of course some other features too, that, uh, like for example, having uh, analog triggers and buttons and stuff like that. So some standardized buttons today, assuming the game even uses those buttons to begin with, are missing. What is the number one reason why I am not using this controller, though? It's not anything that you see here, or anything you'd see here, or even the ability to adjust the turbo speed that you have on the back. It uses the game port. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, remember the game port? The reason why I wound up having to get rid of this thing. When I upgraded my sound card, and I didn't want to use up an extra slot with the game port. Plus, uh, yeah, 
Plus, I wanted something with a better analog stick, although it was nice that you could center this thing by using these little sliders here. So if it was off, you could adjust it via hardware instead of playing around in the Windows control panel. But yeah, sadly, an old game port controller, so eventually I just wanted to go USB and be done with it. So, what did I end up replacing it with? The Logitech Wingman Action Pad. The first USB-based controller that I ever had. D-pad, analog stick, mode button, a start button, similar to a Sega six-button controller, except it's got shoulder buttons and a slider, and a throttle slider. Perfectly fine controller, still works to this day. How come I don't use it? Second stick is missing, might need more buttons, but the biggest reason why I don't use this thing today is compatibility issues. Since this controller came out, we've had direct input, rise and fall as a standard, and now X input on PC controllers. So this, ha this controller has compatibility issues, and it doesn't have a stick, and it's missing some buttons. Unfortunately, this is the first controller where I want to replace it. Well, no, actually, no. I want Another big problem with this is that this is concave instead of convex. So as you did your, your thing with the analog stick, your thumb would constantly end up on the edge of this thing rather than in the middle because that's where, basically, that's where you'd always gravitate to. It's the way it works with these things. Eventually, though, eventually Logitech decided to upgrade this to something with two sticks as DualShock became more of a standard feature, and that is where we get the Logitech Wingman Rumble Pad. Force feedback, force feedback, two analog sticks. What more could you ask for? Well, a controller whose analog sticks didn't come off after very little amount, very little amount of use. A uh, controller whose sticks were convex instead of concave, like the console controllers at the time, and that didn't have mushy buttons. They tried making analog-ish buttons here, but what would, what would often happen is it would be actually a chore to press these buttons to get them to register. It still had, it still had the usual buttons on top, though, and some more stuff in the middle for mode and rumble. But I went through two of these because of this right here. This piece kept coming off on usually the right stick. So what do you know? Went through two of these and eventually started looking for controllers that were more like the far more popular dual shocks than whatever this was supposed to be. Behold, the Logitech Dual Action, my first ever controller to basically mimic the DualShock formula and get it mostly right. It had two sets of buttons, although they're digital instead of analog. D-pad, two sticks, buttons all over the place, and things like that. Except for one notable issue. Square, whereas the contemporary PlayStation controllers had this part as round, so things went around in circles a lot easier than they do on this controller. Details, details, details. So I was really enjoying playing with a somewhat dual shocky controller on my PC games until I found out that there was a rumble version of this very same controller. Time to, yay, 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 time to spend money all over again just to get my force feedback back. Voila! The Logitech Rumble Pad, a perfectly fine controller. It has force feedback, two sets of buttons, D-pad, two sticks, although unfortunately still square, and was my controller of choice for quite some time. But I ultimately wound up having to ditch it. Why did I end up having to ditch it? Compatibility. This controller is about five years old and does not support X input. It is a direct input only controller, unfortunately. And because, and only because of X input, I had to get rid of this. Because I had certain games that required X input, such as Bastion and Final Fantasy III on Steam. X input fixed all the issues with not being able to use a controller or having it be very hard to configure a controller. What a stupid reason to spend more money on controllers when this is a perfectly fine piece of hardware. And lastly, we have this, the Logitech F310. Pretty much the standard for Logitech PC controllers these days, with a lot done right. Although I don't like the D-pad. It move it's too high it's too high centered. The NES D-pad blew it out of the water. So, we got two buttons, we've got an Xbox 360-ish layout with A, B, X, Y. We have dual thumbsticks with round things now, so you can actually spin them properly, just like on a dual shock. Buttons on the edge, and analog triggers that can be used for all those driving games that use this kind of stuff. And on the bottom, the biggest feature of all, and the reason why I got it, a switch to switch between direct input and X input. So all those X input games will be supported by this. Except, once again, I have given up 
my force feedback to get a newer controller. So guess what I have to get in order to get the force feedback back? That <laughs> force feedback back. <laughs> oh, there's a little Logitech button too. Kind of similar to the buttons that the wireless controllers have. So guess what I have to do in order to get my force feedback back? Well, there is a Rumble version of this, which has already been discontinued and is going for prices of around $80. Too steep. Instead, I can get the wireless version of this and start having to mess with batteries and all that other lovely stuff for around $50. Again, having to buy new controllers for the dumbest of reasons. Does it ever end? Perhaps the biggest issue with all this controller brouhaha is all the proprietary stuff that's getting shoved down folks' throats in companies' attempts to get people to part with their hard-earned money. Meanwhile, is there a standard that these controllers could have followed all these years to avoid all of this? Yes, USB's been around for quite some time. How come all these incremental improvements need to come out? Exactly what is the improvement of X input over direct input? Why do people have to keep buying controllers again and again and again for reasons other than the controller wore out or broke? And the reasons just keep getting dumber and dumber and the Dorkly satire, change the white balance, and the Dorkly satire keeps being proven right again and again and again. Someday this will change. Well, we can all wish upon a star, can't we? I think. Till next time, this is Multimedia J, signing off. Thanks for stopping by.